This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by False Idols, a high-stakes thriller for fans of White Collar and Homeland. False Idols is a production of Serial Box, which brings you serialized fiction from teams of today's best writers. To get a discount on the first season of any Serial Box series, visit SerialBox.com and use the promo code GEEK18. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 295 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing the new Netflix series Altered Carbon, based on the novel by Richard K. Morgan. And this will include spoilers for the first 10 episodes of the show, so just be aware of that. And I'm joined by three guests. So first up, we've got Daniel H. Wilson, who you may remember from our panel on Blade Runner 2049 back in episode 277, our panel on video games and books and movies back in episode 163, and our panel on robot uprisings back in episode 107. He holds a PhD in robotics from Carnegie Mellon University, and his New York Times bestselling novel Robopocalypse is currently being adapted for film by Steven Spielberg. His latest novel, The Clockwork Dynasty, is out now. So Daniel, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. The next up, we've got Beth Elderkin, who you may remember from our panel on The Handmaid's Tale back in episode 263. She's a staff writer and video host for io9, and you should all go check out her io9 posts, How Altered Carbon Handles Its Unique Whitewashing Issue, and Altered Carbon's showrunner on the only book scene she insisted be changed. Along with Abby Kindler, she co-hosts Once Upon a Timing, an episodic podcast about ABC's fairy tale drama Once Upon a Time. So Beth, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And also joining us today is Anthony Ha, making his sixth appearance on the show. He covers media, advertising, and pop culture for the news site TechCrunch, where he also hosts the podcast Original Content. A chapbook of his short stories called Love Songs for Monsters was published by Youth in Decline in 2014. So, Anthony, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be back. And today's show is brought to you by False Idols, about an FBI agent who goes deep undercover in Cairo's glittering art world. False Idols is a production of Serial Box a new company that brings you serialized fiction from teams of today's best writers. The team behind False Idols includes Patrick Lahir, author of Radiant Night, Diana Wren, author of Tokyo Heist, Lisa Klink, who was a writer on Star Trek Voyager, and Robert Whitman, who is the founder of the FBI's Art Crime Division. And here's a description of the book. It says, FBI linguist Leila Eldeeb is deep undercover, posing as an heiress in the Middle East. She must infiltrate the highest echelons of society in order to trace priceless relics from their millionaire owners back to illegal digs and the terrorist groups profiting from their sale. But Layla's troubled past and growing feelings for an art dealer's son begin to complicate her judgment, and when she uncovers a terrorist plot that threatens American and Egyptian lives, she must decide where her loyalties truly lie. Based on true events, False Idols is a tense, sexy international thriller. So if that sounds like your sort of thing, you can join the plot with Serial Box right now. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy listeners can get a discount on the first season of any Serial Box series by going to SerialBox.com and entering the promo code GEEK18. So that's S-E-R-I-A-L-B-O-X.com, and the code is GEEK18. The first episode of False Idols, titled Operation Cairo, is also available as a free ebook over at Amazon.com. All right, so now let's get to our panel. Okay, so let's start off with Anthony, who volunteered this week to read Altered Carbon, the book, to be ready for this panel. So, and this book was uh, published, I think, in 2002. So, uh, Anthony, what do you think kind of going and reading this book? Uh, how does it hold up? Well, uh, I guess the first thing I should say is, you know, I saw the show first and then read the book, which is not, you know, something I would recommend for anyone, especially to do it in such close proximity, because I just kept going back and forth between the two in my head. Um, but overall, I thought I was pretty impressed with it. Um, I mean, it's obviously not a particularly old book, but it is, you know, it's been about 15 years and certain elements I think maybe are, are somewhat dated, but overall I, I think it's it's a pretty strong book and I was really glad I got to read it. Mm-hmm. I mean, Daniel, you were saying that you read the book when it first came out, right? Yeah, and I, I haven't reread it since then, but I did crack it open into a really cringy sex scene. <laughs> um, that uh, that reminds me that, you know, 99% of all science fiction authors should remember never to ever 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 in detail write sex scenes it's just (laughs) it can just go so wrong so you just open the book up and it happened to come to that scene (laughs) yeah when ortega and uh 
and and you know she's kind of in love with Riker, and Ortega kind of hooks up with um with the, with the protagonist, Kovacs. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so you don't like the the sex scenes, not good. Um, but what do you think of the book overall? Do you, I mean, you said you liked it, I think, right? Yeah, no, I loved it at the time when I read it. I mean, it's just such a cool high concept, right? The idea of taking your your brain out and sticking it into a different body, and oddly enough, I mean, it's it's a high concept that works out really well for film you know even better i would say than in a book where it's hard to really keep it in your head you know this notion that wait like this this old lady is actually in the body of a of a young like skinhead looking dude you know um that plays out so well in the in the film or in the tv show that uh i really was pumped about that but i loved the book whenever i read it and uh and i also liked the, the show Mm-hmm. How about Beth? Do you have any uh, any thoughts about the book? Yeah, I mean, I kind of I kind of plowed through the book. I was on about a, an eight hour flight, and so I was going to go visit the set for the show uh, late last early last year. So I was like, okay, I really want to read the book so I know what the heck is going on and know what questions to ask. And I thought it was fine. I didn't really feel a need to read the other books, which I didn't. Uh, but when I you know I was enjoying it all right. I feel like there are some writing issues in the book that don't really hold up over time uh, particularly uh, Morgan's uh, focus on female breasts he writes about those a lot and also you know <laughs> if you'll pardon my language he writes about a lot about erections and stuff you know it's like okay this is about the third or fourth time I have to read about the private activities of this man I'm I'm kind of good now Wait, you're telling me that wasn't random that I just cracked the book open <laughs> and landed no, on like a pretty horrific sex scene. <laughs> it's pretty darn common, yeah. <laughs> well, well that explains that. Hmm. Well, so tell us about your, your set visit. How did that come about? Uh so yeah, so I went for IO9 and it was it was actually my first set vis- set visit because I did more traditional media before going to IO9. And it was a very impressive, like you see, you see the scale on the show. And honestly, it looks even bigger in real life, if that actually makes sense. The, the street sets, the, the, uh, the man, the Bancroft mansion, the, the meticulousness that went into the design for it is incredible. And the people behind the show cared a lot about what they were making. Yeah. Um, that's cool. So do you have any other, just sort of anything else from the set visit that kind of sticks out in your mind? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the really cool stuff was in the set design. Uh, the, the guy who did it has you know, worked on a lot of different projects. He's very well known. And I asked him kind of for some little hints and details, uh, that, you know, maybe things that you wouldn't even notice, uh, like the, the use of books in, in the Bancroft study, for example, is a show of his wealth because print and books are basically obsolete and they're collector's items. And then one little tidbit that they apparently they actually filmed a scene for this, but it didn't make it into the final product uh, to show their power, much how they use the snake. Uh, you know, she, the, the woman has, you know, put the mind of someone into a snake. The Bancrofts actually put minds of enslaved people into koi fish and they just swim around in their koi pond in his oh my god (laughs) and they're just there all the time so now you can envision that just enslaved people in the bancroft mansion all the time that's pretty cool that's pretty cool stuff and i mean like the i agree with you that the the visuals in the show and the the sense of a living breathing world were i thought the strongest part of the show for me um does everyone else feel that way anthony you agree with that yeah, I mean, I think the visuals, it, it's interesting because, you know, it, it obviously is very strongly influenced. I mean, I think any sort of like kind of noirish mystery science fiction show is going to be influenced by Blade Runner. And that's certainly true here. But it's still like even knowing that influence, I think it looks terrific. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought it was beautiful. I, although, yeah, the stuff that takes place in the rainy neon hologram filled streets, uh, you know, that was just a little bit like, OK, We've seen this done before, um, but I guess it gets them from one place to another. <laughs> well, so Daniel, so you were saying that the the concept of this is really strong and works really well in film, and I agree with that as well. Um, so maybe just for listeners, let's let's just say what the show is about. So we're a couple hundred years in the future, and there's this new technology which has been somehow derived from ex- an extinct alien race um, called the cortical stack. 
where it's this sort of digital device that gets implanted in your spinal column and records all of your your mental state so that if your body dies, uh, as long as this cortical stack piece of uh, machinery is recovered, they can just uh, stick it into a new body and uh, and upload it. And now you have a new body that you're in. And uh, this, the technology is... Um, you know, common enough that people use it for all sorts of different things, but mostly uh, the wealthy have the most access to it. And so they are basically immortal because they just keep switching into new bodies. And so as the story opens, there's a, okay, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff, um, but just the, uh, <laughs> the bare, bare bones of the, the setup is that there's a guy who has been, um, his, his cortical, his cortical stack has kind of been in storage. He's been in prison effectively, for a couple hundred years, and he gets revived and uh, assigned basically to solve a murder case uh, of one of these wealthy immortals who has been murdered mysteriously, but he's been brought back because of his uh, cortical stack, um, you know, backup thing. Although this uh, this rich guy, he has a kind of different cortical stack sort of backup, and I thought this was really really cool. The whole I, I, it was worth it watching the whole show just for this because his uh, mental state gets backed up to a military satellite uh, that orbits <laughs> overhead every forty eight hours, and so he's been killed, and so he's gotten his backup, and so he doesn't know how he was murdered because he doesn't have any memories from the last forty eight hours, which is when his last backup to the satellite was made. So there's a lot more stuff to the show, but that's sort of the basics. Um, is there anything anything that sort of sticks out sticks out to you guys that we should mention just to uh, uh, let listeners know kind of what's going on basically in the show? Well, it bears mentioning that in the distant past, uh, you know, the protagonist was trained as like a military person who wanted to prevent the adoption of this technology in the first place, right? Is that what envoys were kind of... Uh, going for so he's kind of a super agent brought out a cold storage to solve a crime you know it's like a pretty um i don't know it's a pretty good launch into the world yeah no i agree with that i think the first episode of this is just the, the setup is really really strong it's kind of a classic uh locked room mystery with this interesting science fiction twist um how about beth are there any other uh, any other sort of story details we should lay out at the beginning here I mean, the only one that, but it more gets developed as we go on, is the background of Takeshi Kovac, and I think it is important to show, to point out that you know he's he's in a new body that he doesn't recognize. He wasn't brought out of storage voluntarily. He doesn't want to be here, and so a lot of his motivation is kind of trying to figure out, you know, do I want to go back in storage? You know, you know, and also having to work with Bancroft, who you know, exerts a certain control over him right from the get-go. Yeah. Uh, Anthony, anything else you want to mention here? Um, no, I think that pretty much, I mean, <laughs> as you said, there's a lot that we could add, but um, I guess that'll come up as we're talking about it. I don't want to, like, overload this with plot summary right now. Yeah. All right, well, so I said that the first episode I thought was really good. Do you agree with that? Were you sort of on board uh, with the first episode? Yeah, and I mean, I think that the, the one is that it's interesting because I think the first, especially like 10, 20 minutes of it, um, are this really amazingly sort of uh, disorienting because I hadn't, again, you know, I saw the show first, so I had no idea really what the setup was or what was going on. And it's just this completely, you know, drop you in the middle of the story kind of situation where you're just like desperately trying to understand who these characters are. But like in, in this way that I thought was like pretty like brave and enjoyable. And so there's the part of the episode which is just what the hell is going on okay i kind of am starting to get it and then there's the sort of more classic kind of setup of the locked room mystery as you put it and i mean i thought both halves were good but um and i think that was part of why the episode was was also particularly enjoyable was because it had um you know both of those elements maybe it, it tailed off a little at the end because then there it turns into this sort of thing about whether, whether uh, Takeshi is actually going to take the case but because there's a show you know he's going to take the case and so having you know a, a that's what my wife was word, shouting at the TV yeah <laughs> he's like no I'm not going to and then the rest of it is just watching this stack as it's just you know sitting in a shelf for nine episodes. right yeah and you're just like wow I didn't see that coming uh, but they did not go in that direction <laughs> I mean, so Beth, did you, uh, were you sort of on board with the show from in the first couple episodes? Were you enjoying them? 
Well, as far as the first episode goes, I think there's one thing that really works for it and then one thing that kind of works against it, but in a way where it's easily forgivable. I think it's really amazing that it was Miguel Sapochnik who directed the first episode. He's a really he's known for Game of Thrones. He's one of their notable directors. He's coming in for season eight. He's done some of the series' best episodes, and I feel visually this one stands out from all the other ones, and you can really see his personal touch. And that's really what I think kind of grips you from the very beginning is how he frames the, you know, how abstract he represents Takeshi coming into the world and grappling with all these memories that are, you know, kind of coming at him from left and right. And he doesn't know what to make of it. Uh, the, the one thing that was took me a little bit out of it was I feel like Kristen Ortega, Detective Ortega, was given the role of like exposition fairy. <laughs> like every single line she has in the episode with maybe one or two exceptions is exposition dump. And, and it's okay because there's a lot of information to get out, you know, a lot of stuff from the book that needs to be explained for the audience. But at the same time, it's like, oh my God, Kristen, are you just, okay, just like, okay, what more have we got for me? All right, girl, we're going to sit in a car. Just tell me everything you know. <laughs> okay, let's do it again. Well, it was interesting because I, I watched all 10 episodes and I just had time to go back and I rewatched just the first episode. And that was something that strikes you watching it for a second time. It's like everything is like, oh, OK, this like everything is being set up, you know, in a way that I I, yeah. I totally didn't appreciate the first time. But we see the, uh, you know, there's the thing about the, the woman, uh, the woman found in the bay who fell into the water. And there's the thing about the floating, um, you know, brothel in the sky. Like I didn't even catch any. I, I sort of, you know. The first time through, you know, that does none of that stuff really means anything to you. So it doesn't, you know, but it's all it's all sort of there, all being set up. Um, but but yeah. Um, and then another thing in the first episode is that there's this uh, AI hotel. Uh, it's called the Raven Hotel. When there's this uh, AI proprietor who's the sort of uh, doppelganger of Edgar Allan Poe. I thought that was all pretty cool. Um, yeah. Daniel, that seems oh, like yeah. your sort of thing. Were you were you into that hotel? Dude. I was so into that hotel. <laughs> I was so excited about that scene. This the show does a really good job of paying off like vengeance, right? Because the, with with the setup they've got, you can really inflict a lot of organic damage, as they call it. You know? <laughs> and the stakes are a little uh, they're higher and lower, right? Because you can suffer forever, uh, especially if you get your brain trapped in a virtual torture porn, but. Like, I really loved it whenever he teamed up with that AI. And, and maybe my, one of my favorite moments of the whole th of the whole series was when that AI goes and talks. I can't remember if it's the first episode. He goes, Poe goes and talks to other AIs. And one of them says to him, what do you care about humans? You know, <laughs> who cares about human beings? We, we're AIs. We've got all this amazing stuff we can explore. And the fact that he's obsessed with, with humanity. I love that. I just love that dynamic from an AI uh, character. And I thought he was really super well done um, as a character in the whole series. And I was really bummed about, you know, how that storyline ended. Yeah. I guess we should explain. So so the one of the implications of these cortical stack things is that if you shoot someone, you know, in the chest or something and kill them, they're still fine. But you can always, you know, you have the option of just going up and sticking your gun on their neck and blowing it away, which is going to kill them permanently. Um, and so, um, there's still tension because you could always still just get a random shot through your cortical stack, killing you permanently. Or if you're disabled, someone can always just come up and stick a gun to your neck and blow you away. So it's not just like you're immortal, no matter what happens to you, you're going to be fine. So I, well, I, it seems like I there's always also have a quandary. Like a legal... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I always had a quandary about that because you never see anyone with, like, neck protectors. Neck yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why that? is it neck armor, like, the biggest thing? Especially if... It's like Highlander. Exactly. <laughs> you know, you know like, or in Futurama <laughs> where they wear, you know, the things on the back of their heads. So, anyway. But, yeah, that seems like something that should have been at least mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was going to say also the other thing uh, maybe worth mentioning is just that there seems to be a legal framework around that where um, if you... You know, if you if you if you kill someone's you know a physical body, their sleeve, that seems like that probably is a crime. But like the much more serious crime is if you destroy their their stack, which is like I guess called real death. And and so like there's the like I guess a really important distinction um, in terms of like whether or not someone's guilty of you know just killing a, a physical body or or real murder. 
Yeah. One thing I was curious about was where did all these sleeves come from? And if they're all clones, why weren't there more identical sleeves? Because you never see the same person twice except for with the the Methuselahs, the really rich people who make their own bodies, clone their own bodies. Where do you think all the sleeves are coming from? Well, well a lot of them are kidding. prisoners. <laughs> people, prisoners, rejected bodies. I think... I think what is also implied is that you can like loan out your body if you're in debt or something. You know, you like you put yourself on ice and then your body gets used up by other people in the hopes that you'll get a new body one day. They don't that's something that actually isn't very well explained, at least not in the show. Mm -hmm. But there is this great sequence where um they want uh uh, Chris, uh Kristen Ortega wants her grandmother to come spend mm -hmm. uh the day of the dead with them and so um, she sort of brought her uh, personalities brought out of storage and put into the body of some like biker guy. Um, I thought that whole thing was just was just fantastic. How about that acting, right? <laughs> like, have you guys ever seen that? I mean, have you ever seen an actor? I mean, what kind of job is that to take? This guy's like a six foot four. Uh, he looks like a like a biker, right? Like he's got tattoos all over his shaved head, this big crazy beard, and it's like some. Some casting director was like, okay, so you need to be – in this role, you will be abuelita. You will be a little tiny, like, <laughs> um, <laughs> grandma who's, like, in love with her family and so gentle and happy. <laughs> Eddie just shows up and he just totally killed that role. <laughs> and, I mean, I loved it. That's it's one of the things I love most about the series. And episode eight is when they nail this, uh, when uh, – I can't remember the guy's name, but – but anyway, someone's wife comes back, you know, and she gets cross-sleeved, which is whenever you are in a different gender. Oh, man, that was good stuff. So I will, um, like, the, the the biker guy who played the abuelita, uh, he was one of my favorite parts of the show, along with the one you're talking about, Ava, who is uh, uh, Ava Elliott. Uh, and I actually, I couldn't find the actor's name, but I wanted to, like, give him a shout out in my review. <laughs> his wife actually contacted me. You can't really find his credit, but his name is Matt Beadle. Bidel. I'm probably saying his last name wrong, but I want to give him a shout out because I thought he was one of the best performances of the whole season. He's <laughs> incredible, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, he was amazing. Um, and I think we should also mention, so there's also this uh, religion in this world called Neo-Catholicism. And the archdiocese, we're told, is um, has the view that if you... Um, you know, if you use this technology to to spin up again, to to resleeve yourself in a new body, that you go to hell. Um, so people who are adherents of this religion sort of have themselves marked. It's like DNR, basically, um, and and so so they don't get spun up again if they die, and that becomes important to the plot. Um, that felt like one of the weaker elements of the series, don't you think? Like all those people like protesting or whatever, that just felt kind of like phoned in, like. Who are they? Where are they? Why are they protesting in the streets? Like, what's their point? Like, <laughs> well, no, but they were protesting outside the prison, right? Because the prisoners yeah. are getting resleeved, right? I mean, I agree I with know. you. It felt sort of, it didn't have as much of a sense of reality as some of the other things in the show. Yeah, I did like how they had Ortega's family kind of represent the mentality behind that because in the book, yeah. it's not really well explored, and and Takeshi doesn't really care. However, I, you guys are right. I think that there could have been more exploration as to why. Like we, it, it's kind of one of the things. Like, oh, it's just the way it is. Well, why don't you want to resleep? It's just, it's just the way it is. It's just we do it, and yeah. that's it, and we're good. I'm like, good. You guys can live forever. You gotta have a better explanation than that. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, I guess like I believed that like that you could just sort of accept it, but also yeah, the way that people, I, no one. Seem, there never seemed, I guess maybe except for Kristen herself, who I guess is, is no longer really sort of in the religion, but, but it, it, I guess like, I imagine that the, I think a lot of ways like religion works, right, is, is there's also this sort of gray area where people kind of believe, they kind of don't. And, and so it, the way it also di like divided everyone up very neatly into like yes or no, I thought felt like it was a little bit schematic as well. Also, but, why wouldn't they not have the cortical stack ever installed? I mean, what religious person is going to let their infant baby or their one-year-old get this thing put in their neck if they think it's gonna doom them to an eternity in hell like it feels like there'd be people without stacks and and they all had stacks right even though they were religious 
I right. thought the... and that's why they were able to. I mean, then yeah, the, the, I mean that becomes important later on. So it did, seems like everyone has a stack. Did Kristen's yeah. mother have a stack? Because she was I think op- so. opposed yeah. to. It. I think everyone has them. They say that they give it to you when you're a baby. Yeah. And they, that's why, because they want to, you know, that's one of the big, you know, mysteries of the show or is this legal case where they want to revive dead people who were who were registered as neo-Catholics to testify in court cases. Now, if they were, if neo-Catholics didn't have the stack, then this wouldn't be an issue. So I think that it's a, it, I think it's an assumption that all of them have stacks, even if they don't plan on using them. Yeah, so I guess that's just another world-building detail is that there's been this recent law called uh, Rule 653 or something, which was going to make an exception where people could be brought back, even if they were neo-Catholics, in order to testify about who murdered them. And this law was recently defeated, um, which also plays, like like everything sort of plays into a, a conspiracy as the show goes on. But I mean, I feel like a lot of people would not be cool with this te- and just in the real world i mean just just in the last uh, episode or two i interviewed bill mckibben the environmental activist and he had a book enough that we talked about and i feel like he would mm-hmm. not be into this at all um <laughs> so i mean i yeah. feel like there are a lot of people who would uh not you know who if if told that there's this technology that'll restore your consciousness into a clone body or whatever uh there would be a lot of opposition to that i feel like i mean that's not impossible yeah Hey, before before we move on, I wanted to speak to my feeling about the first episode, which is I had a bit of a different experience than, than everybody else in that I really felt like every new episode got better. And I, mm-hmm. the first episode, the first episode, honestly, the the protagonist, he looks a little bit like the guy from The Expanse. And when I started <laughs> realizing that it was like, oh, it's a bunch of weirdos in the future and there's been a murder and then there's like, a detective guy and I was just like had this sinking feeling because I was like why does it always have to be a detective story like in the future can't they do any other type of story like uh and then he's walking around in the rain and then there's that moment when he goes into the to the hotel and the guy has an old hat you know like because the hat the fedora thing is such a big deal in the expanse and anyway I was just like oh man this is this is gonna be rough and then it got better you know but I was scared at the beginning <laughs> that it was going to be rehash of something I'd seen already. Well, I agree with you that the adherence of this show to film noir conventions was among my least favorite aspects of the show. I mean, one thing I really don't like particularly about the fil- the whole film noir uh, thing is just how the uh, the detective will just go around being a total jerk to everyone he meets yeah. and pointlessly <laughs> antagonize everyone and just get himself, uh, you know, assaulted or kidnapped repeatedly when he could have avoided this just by being, you know, more savvy or polite um, in the in how he was pursuing the case. And and yeah, so I, I, I mean, I really love this show. I, there's a lot of things I really like about it, particularly the world building and so on, as I was saying. But yeah, one of my big gripes is that I feel like, uh, like, and I know this isn't true, but it feels to me like it was written by and for teenage boys. And so, David, you're David. You're more of a Matlock fan than like a Mar- Philip Marlowe fan. <laughs> like you want a, a genteel detective who will yeah, well, because uh, you will go around and yeah. Well, I like watching. I, sm- I like watching smart characters do smart things, and so I would rather watch a smart detective be savvy and manipulative or charming or whatever than just yeah. you know being a kind of like and and, and just sorry let me f- finishing my teenage boy kind of thing it's just like it just feels a lot of this just feels to me like a teenage boy fantasy it's like oh i'm just this badass guy i just go around and i'm just like sulky and uh you know i just tell people what's what and then i kick their ass and then there's like all these beautiful women and they're all in one way or another mm-hmm. in love with me or obsessed with me and uh and that was yeah i could have I, I that was sort of one of my those aspects of the show that was my least favorite aspects of the show. I would also say that the show sort of, in terms of that sort of like not, not at least not in the, in the initial episodes, a not particularly bright seeming, you know, very sort of like, uh, you know, quote unquote, unlikable detective. It sort of doubled down on that because Takeshi is that way. And then Kristen is also kind of that way. There's a lot of like 
scenes of, you know, them like butting heads with superiors and butting heads with the authorities and, and, and sort of having your two leads be like that can get pretty grating, I thought as well. And as much time as we spend on this investigation, it really doesn't go anywhere until the giant villain exposition that lasts her about <laughs> two episodes straight. <laughs> like, I mean, I read the book, so I knew where the investigation was going and where it was going to end. And even I was really confused. And I didn't feel like they were actually getting any damn work done. And then all of a sudden, you know, the big bad villain, who I will not spoil yet, uh, just kind of comes in and goes, okay, here's everything that you need to know. I'm going to just fill in all the blanks because there's like 45 of them. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with that because, well, because in the first episode, um, Takeshi gets uh, sort of jumped by this squad of goons. Uh, and then a lot of the next couple episodes have to do with the uh, fallout from that, which turns out to be kind of uh, pointless um, as mm -hmm. it develops. Um, yeah, I don't know how spoilerish we want to get this early, but... Um, I, I agree that, yeah, that, that there isn't a, a really good sense of him solving the crime, um, you know, episode to episode and, oh, this clue, you know, I, I feel like a lot of the, the first five episodes or so are all red herrings, um, <laughs> you know, so yeah, I agree with that. Which I, I suspect is part of what maybe is where I'm on board with what Daniel was saying about the episodes getting better is that like the plot just definitely kicks in much more strongly in the second half. And at that point, it be, it, you know, the show really got its hooks on uh, into me, whereas the first few episodes was like, oh, this is interesting. This looks good. I'm kind of curious where this is going, as opposed to really kind of feeling hooked. Yeah, it's a lot of naked people and a lot of fighting and, <laughs> and a lot of cool outfits and costumes and everything and that's great but that can only take you so far um and then you you know you start to finally care about the group of people that he's collected around himself and you know that's just saying that we've got these two protagonists who are really jerks and that's true and and what happens though is they collect a group of people who are less jerky around them and by the time we get to episode five or six we've got kind of a a crew and and a little bit of uh, relief from just the onslaught of people being dicks to each other <laughs> and and cutting each other up and yeah punching each other in the face well right so so one of the early i think it's episode four or so um takeshi gets tortured in this virtual reality dungeon kind of thing Oof. Uh, sounds like beth has opinions about that <laughs> yeah okay so this was one of the things I really didn't like about the book was the whole torture scene, uh, because I don't know if if there's those who don't know, but it's all virtual, it's all digital, it's all in his mind, and in the in mind, the, the torture puts him in the body of a woman who's connected to his past, something troubling from his past, and he's tortured as a woman, and includes it's very horrific, includes genital mutilation, it's very bad. And, you know, the showrunner rightfully changed it to have it be, you know, Joel Kinnaman himself during the torture, which made a lot of sense. However, upon watching it, one, I couldn't watch a lot of it because it was very graphic and unsettling. And two, I don't feel like we got anything out of it. It seemed to only be included because it was in the book and it didn't teach me anything about the character that I didn't already know. Oh, he's brash and he'll kill people when he's mad. We've seen him do <laughs> that like three times already. I think they tried to use it as a way because he kept flipping back in his mind to lessons from um, what's the lady that he was in love with? Kel. Kel, yeah. And, and I think that they tried to use it to demonstrate his training as an envoy. But you're right. It was a tenuous kind of connection there. It's like, yeah, look, is he a, is he going to be able to withstand the the stuff or not? Like, they just kept cutting to him being tortured and then cutting back. It's like, just show me the, everything that happened in the past so that I can determine whether he's going to be able to deal with the torture. Like, there's pointless to jump back and forth um, because the torture part isn't conveying any information. Well, and I, I, I mean, I don't necessarily have a problem with the torture setup per se, but. Just from a, a, a technical, this is kind of maybe stupid, but just from a technical standpoint, I don't like the trope that you can defeat VR by just through sheer force of will. 
um, the sort of matrix <laughs> kind of thing. If you uh, believe it, you can achieve anything. Yeah, that that just seems <laughs> stupid to me, and uh, um, and so yeah, uh, well, so, so that's why it's it a didn't bit of really... a... It was a deus ex at the end. He just closed his eyes and was like, boop, okay, I'm out of here. And it's like, couldn't you have just done that? Like, and saved me 25 minutes of my life? <laughs> like, you know. Well, well, and then once like, he gets out, he's he sort of like um, convinces them that he's a SeaTac agent and they've really screwed up. And that was good. I mean, I thought that he should have, you know, we, we could have seen that his training has enabled him to endure torture much longer than an ordinary person would be able to but there should be something clever about the way he gets out of this not just like magical you know if you believe in it you can anything is possible kind of stuff yeah maybe he convinces them that he's SeaTac inside the vr and they wake him up it's the exact same thing and doesn't have this magic magical realism element did you guys yep. notice that the next episode starts with him torturing somebody <laughs> Like it was really, it was it felt like a very clear message. Like he has learned nothing. Like <laughs> this torturing people is like part of his. It's just like on the menu for him, right? Like, He's like just because it's not effective on me doesn't mean it's not effective yeah. on him. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Well, uh, I think this this raises this raises the issue though, right? Of is this show just too violent overall? I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are going to think it is. I mean, there were even there was like one part in particular. I don't even remember exactly when it was, but somebody gets shot in the throat and their blood splatters all over somebody's face or something, and it actually made me laugh. It was so over the top. Um, but I don't know what you guys, uh, Anthony, what do you think of it? Was this show too violent? Do you think? I didn't have. I'm trying to. Th I mean, I, I guess like when we talk about violence, there's a couple of different things. Well, like one is like. I think there are a couple of moments where there's sort of like gore effects and blood and and I don't know that it always worked, but I, I guess it, it wasn't so over the top that it that it, it was something that bothered me a lot about the show. Um I think, you know, the maybe tying it tying it back to what we were talking about earlier, it bothered me just in the sense that it just felt like a lot of situations boiled down to somebody being tortured or somebody having to like fight their way out of some situation in a way that felt a little bit repetitive and again didn't necessarily make me think that our like lead detectives were actually that great at detecting um <laughs> so in that sense it was sort of formulaic but i it didn't bother me i guess like the violence i mean the torture i mean the torture got mon monotonous um and i i guess it also it felt like they, f they they fell back on that trope of just like all right now i'm gonna like beat the shit out of somebody to like get this information that i need a little bit too often um, but it didn't strike me as a particularly violent show, I guess, in the way that you're talking about where it's just like blood everywhere and everyone's just getting shot to bits, although there are a few scenes like that. Well, it's funny because the um, interview I saw with the showrunner, she said that this was originally in development as a feature film rated PG-13. Oh, uh, God. <laughs> which is very diff and like, And they were, and she, I think she said like they, rather than the um, – the the sex workers at the end being quote unquote snuff whores they wanted to make them lap dancers and just like all sorts of stuff where it just it like makes no sense at all so i mean I'm, I'm glad that they they did this as a hard r kind of you know gritty science fiction tv show i, I just thought there were, it was a little a little little <laughs> it suffers uh, from sometimes it suffers from the game of thrones effect like game of thrones spent has spent years dialing up the level of violence and sexual violence and depravity, depravity that they, that they can expose us to in order to like, you know, continue to get through to audiences that are like increasingly numb to that kind of stuff. And then they had to basically go farther than game of Thrones and they had to do it in their first season. So like by the end of this, whenever they're trying to make it very clear that the big bad person who comes back, who I guess I won't spoil yet either that uh, this person is a bad person. Yeah, it involves, like, child rape and child ki killing children and, like, every damn terrible thing you can think of. The people aren't just naked. There's, like, vaginas and penises hanging around like crazy all over throughout this series. Like, they have to, I feel like, go farther and, and you know, with the sex and the violence than than uh, Game of Thrones has gone. And it's kind of jarring to me. I felt like this was a very violent uh show um i kind of i kind of liked it <laughs> but you know <laughs> and it kind of fits with the theme these bodies are disposable you know when bodies are disposable whether they're naked or not doesn't matter like whether they get shot up it doesn't matter as much um and so you know it's sort of at least it fit the theme it didn't feel forced 
this seems okay, like a good. this seems like a show where it's really going to be on a case by case basis. Like I, like I actually had to close my eyes a lot because I will pass out if I see too much blood <laughs> or gore. Like physically, will drop and faint. So I didn't see too much of it because I had my hand over my eyes. But what I saw as far as nudity, sexual content, violence, it, it didn't bother me because, uh, as he was saying, it works in the context of the show and the message. But I do believe there are going to be people out there who will not be comfortable with the subject material. And so I think as long as people go in with the knowledge, with knowing what to expect and how far it's going to go, then I I think it's going to be fine because this is not for everybody. Well, I think it also runs into the same problem that I think, as you mentioned, Game of Thrones and also Westworld, which are these shows that are, you know, very... In, in somewhat different ways, but have like these sort of cynical view of human nature and are trying to sort of make these sort of bleaker points. And so in some ways they're justified in showing a lot of this violence and sexuality, but sometimes it feels like even in that context, this is, we, you can, you, you, as a viewer, you start to say, yeah, we get it. Everything's shitty. This is all bad. But like, we don't need like the fifth scene of this. At least they didn't include the bestiality. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Or incest, you know? I thought they were going to go that way. Uh, it was <laughs> heavily <off>. implied. <laughs> yes, it was. But uh, we, we dodged that bullet, didn't we? Yep. Uh, well, so, so Daniel, you were talking about how there's this um, sort of flat, there's a sequence of flashbacks where we get Takeshi's backstory. Uh, I feel like it comes in around episode seven or something where like the whole episode is, is basically flashbacks. So let's talk about what his backstory actually is. So it, it turns out that he... Uh, had a sister as a kid, and they had an abusive father, I think, who was, uh, um, you know, um, abusing their mother. And Takeshi, I think, shot him. And then um, rather than go to prison, he kind of gets the, gets, catches the attention of the SeaTac, which was like the Space Marines, basically, and gets recruited into them um, with the agreement that they're going to place his sister with a good foster family um and then well i don't know do you want to daniel why don't you pick up but what happens after that remind me what happens sure. in this uh so flashback. so what happens is he gets recruited by by SeaTac, which is really the airport in seattle but anyway so <laughs> and in a particular individual too actually i thought it was interesting because it's the one thing that maybe i missed it but i don't feel like they paid it off there's this one guy who recruits this kid who's obviously a really tough kid and been through a lot. They train him up as a soldier. He wears the really cool headgear. He runs around, I guess, flying around off-world, completing missions. He's just a bad dude. And then, um, you know, what happens? He, he runs into these uh, – he runs into his sister, right? And he's killing the Yakuza, and she's with the Yakuza, killing SeaTac agents. Then they go back-to-back. And they start blasting everybody. They just kill everybody. <laughs> and he finds out that SeaTac uh, betrayed him. They didn't try to do anything with his sister. They lied about what they were going to do for her. And then they go on the run together, hunted by everybody. And then they kind of randomly fall in with these group called the Envoy, who are uh, like freedom fighters, who are, I guess, battling against the idea of these stats. Uh, and then they get trained up by those people. His sister does sees them just as a means to an end. He falls in love. Uh, and then, you know, and then his sister ultimately kind of betrays him and yeah. kills the woman that he's in love with. Uh, and that's that, right? Yeah. So, I mean, and I, I, I liked the, the envoy sequence in that it, it got away from the film noir stuff and it gets more into sort of like a space opera kind of vibe and it's on an alien planet and, uh, it brought a little variety of the show to me. Uh, to it brought a little variety to the show for me, but I, I, I had a lot of issues with this whole sequence. Um, maybe I can get into them, but I'll give. Uh, how about I'll give other people a chance to go first? So, how about um, Beth? How did you feel about these uh, this flashback sequences? Well, I actually liked it better than his backstory in the book because they changed the envoys significantly. The envoys are the fight, you know, the fighters who will just leave from body to body. Basically, they morph that into Sea Tech. Uh, and instead, they make envoys something he's fighting for. And his sister is an addition, someone to kind of play off of this. She ends up merging with, you know, dun dun dun, the villain character. 
So I actually really liked it. I felt it gave Takeshi motivation. I felt it gave him personality. And I felt it gave him an extra layer of understanding when he's put into this new body because he spent good portion of his life fighting against this very thing that's been done to him. So no wonder he would be really mad about it and he would resent Bancroft for putting him through this. Whereas opposed in the book, he's just just kind of grumpy like all the time. He's just very, <laughs> at least in the first book, he's very grumpy. I don't know what he's like in the second and third book. I haven't read it, you guys. <laughs> so I liked it better and I felt that um the actor, Will, who played original body uh, Tokeshi, was the best version. We can get into this later. Joel Kinnaman <laughs> was my least favorite part of the show. Hmm. All right, yeah, so let's let's come back to that. But so, Anthony, what did you think of the flashbacks? Well, so I agree with Beth that I think that that change from the books of, of making um, his sister the, the enemy um, was just like, to me, like, yeah, it was like, just made the show like significantly better. And conversely, when I was reading the book and I realized that wasn't going to be the case, it really took the air out of it for me. And I was kind of like really trying to understand why he was so motivated to go after this person. It just felt like it really lacked some of the the drama um, and the stakes that, that the show did. Um, I would say the episode, and I liked the idea of this flashback episode. I really liked the actor playing Takeshi. Um, and, but I, I do think there are a couple of key moments where it kind of f- fell down for me. I just thought like the whole conception of the envoy felt kind of thin in this, where it was like, like, especially this moment where she, like, she, Kel gives a speech where she says, like, I've been lying to you about what we're fighting for. Guess what? Yeah. We're fighting to preserve death. Let's go on a suicide mission to preserve death. And everyone's like, I mean, and there is a moment of hesitation, but even so, that still felt very thin and rushed in the same way that I think Takeshi's conversion to from going like, hey, these are good people to stop with to I believe in this cause felt a little bit um, murky to me. Uh, it, it just felt like some of the key moments were a little thin. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that completely. Is that that because what did they think they were fighting for prior to that? It, it just felt really weird to me. And then just the whole character of Kelchrist, um, you know, she's like the best fighter ever. She's like the best at defeating virtual reality ever. She invented the stacks. She's beautiful. She's in love with Takeshi. Just just the whole just the whole character, the character just felt like sort of like too much of a fantasy, like male fantasy. I forgot kind of about thing. the fact that she invented the stacks that. That's that's laying it on so thick. It's just thick. thrown out there as this side. Oh yeah, I, I I invented that shit, and now I want to destroy it. <laughs> yeah, if I mean, wouldn't she be really rich? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> well, and just how did she get to be so much better at everything than everyone else in this universe? It just, I mean, like there could be some explanation for that, but there just wasn't that I saw. Um, and it just, yeah, the whole, th- it just felt, had this weird sort of dreamy quality to it, where, as I think somebody was just saying, it just didn't feel as, as sort of world building strong as, as some of the rest of the stuff. Wait, so I have a question in the show, are the stacks human invented or are they invented by aliens and then adapted by human, by Cal in some way? Yeah, I don't remember the alien stuff from the show. I think the alien stuff might just be in the books. No, no, the alien yeah, stuff's in the show. Well, okay. it wasn't it just a tree from another planet and it had this weird property that they adapted oh, for the that's, technology? That's what the tree is about. That's what it seemed like <laughs> to me. But then I might have tuned out while they were talking about that for a second. <laughs> you might have had your eyes covered during that part. Yeah, the tree was glowing and then they all had magic stacks. I, no, I mean, I, I haven't read the book and I, I knew that the stacks were alien technology so that must be in the show somewhere but then there was also the thing about kel inventing it so i don't know that is a little i don't know maybe she adapted it or something but yeah she's an alien (laughs) (laughs) um but but yeah and so so i had all sorts of problems with that and then just the idea that again again with like just how, how does this technology work just the idea that like everybody on multiple planets has their minds um recorded and you can take the whole thing down by attacking one, like by one attack on one facility. I just don't believe uh, that the, the technology would work that way. Um, and and that's one of my sort of pet peeves in in a lot of fantasy and science fiction kind of stuff, where you can take down the whole robot network or whatever it is by just blowing up one building, you know, because that's just not how technology works. Right. It, it's not like she's let's launch a campaign against this technology. It's like, let's now go on the one mission that will end all of this, which, again, yeah, it doesn't feel very believable. 
Yeah, there's a similar situation in the first episode of season two of Humans where uh, this this android has this technology that can awaken all the robots. And she's like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to awaken all the robots. And she presses it and nothing happens. And it's just like random ones end up waking up around the world. It's like four or five of them. And she's like, well, that was a bust. <laughs> it's kind of a nice little subversion of, of that trope. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then just the fact that they made Kel like be in love with him i i think could have I, I think you could have had a t you, you could have had all the emotional impact and not had a mentor uh, relationship explicit yeah. romance and it, it just would have like again not seemed so much just like a weird fantasy that somebody made up for themselves yeah and i mean it feels true. like this also this hollywood thing where they it's hard for them to believe that like somebody could like would make would convert in that way just for political or like moral reasons there always has to be sort of this personal overlay to it and so it, it yeah it just felt like they were just like well now that explains why he's so into this and and it felt very perfunctory and and it also took time away from the relationship between Takeshi and his sister and so that that really felt not quite there by the end of the episode so who was the lady who gets killed in the opening scene that he's with was she just some lady I mean She's yeah. just some lady, I think. Yeah, it's 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 just a passing moment from the from the opening of the book. It's that killed me because yeah. I spent I spent the whole series being like, "Who's that lady that he was in love with that he was living with or or whatever?" Right? Like, because you just as an audience member, you just sort of make assumptions that the first two people you see are important, and then you know she gets killed, and then he charges the guy screaming, and he gets shot. And what I was going to say earlier is the guy. The SeaTac guy, the one who recruits him as a boy, betrays him, and then ultimately kills him. They never deal with that guy. I was like, how's he going to get revenge on that guy? You know, <laughs> because there's a lot of great revenge that happens in this series that's very satisfying. And did I just miss it? But that guy just, uh, he just lived a long, happy life, uh, in the past, and, or perhaps he's still around, um, but just never got dealt with. Yeah, yeah he's cool. His name is Jaeger. <laughs> He's the German guy. Um, I don't know. Yeah, he may be around in season two. I mean, if, if he's yeah, uh, if the military gives you cortical stack transfers long enough to last two hundred fifty years, um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw him again. Um, but yeah, I agree. The the woman in the first scene, I think, is just like the the girlfriend who just will never measure up to Calchrist. Um, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think there was much more to her. I was wondering about that the whole time. Um, but yeah, so let's see. Okay, so let's talk about the sister, right? So getting back to the flashback. So in the flashback, Takeshi is totally under the spell of Kel, who's going to bring down the cortical stack network and bring death back into the world for everybody. Um because the upper class is now they're immortal and it's just not good for society because it's so unfair and unbalanced and everything. And, uh, and so as I think Anthony was saying, it turns out that the sister Ray betrays them because she feels that Takeshi is being led and on, taken on the suicide mission and she doesn't want to see him killed for this cause that she doesn't particularly believe in. And I thought that was all actually worked pretty well. And I was totally, I could totally see the sister's point of view because I don't want the cortical snack stack network taken down and mm -hmm. doesn't seem worth dying for, for me. So, I mean, I thought that her betrayal of them should have been a lot more like toned down. Um, but the, that, the basic dynamics of that I thought was really good. And I was actually kind of on her side when it comes to that. Yeah. She makes a good point. <laughs> and then she has snakes. Things <laughs> changed. <laughs> Right, they sort of put their hand on the scale by showing like everyone like clawing their eyes out and stuff, and and you know obviously that it ended. But if she'd just been like, you know what, no thanks, goodbye, like you you'd be like, yeah, absolutely, I get it. Or at least give them a chance to be. She should be like, you know, I'm out. Are you coming with me? And or are you gonna stay here? Like it felt like she should have at least been able to say that. Or did she? I mean, was there a part where he said, "See ya"? Well, she didn't want to leave her brother and i think she was tr like they, she was setting it up so that takeshi would be on the plane with them but he got held up so that's why she and quell just went together but her whole plan was to save her and her brother 
and kill everybody else because that is all she cared about. She had been through hell and high water to save her brother. Yeah. So if she had simply left, he wasn't going to leave. So that's not an option yeah. for her. Other option? And yeah. murder everyone. I felt <laughs> like there was – she had a lot of anger too, which, which I found interesting and complex because she felt like he abandoned her, you know, even though he says they said that they were going to take care of you. He didn't stick around to really find out, and he never found out what happened to her. And so it felt like she had some anger, and she wasn't really acknowledging it. She was just, uh, you know, lashing out at him, convincing herself that she's trying to help him, but really just getting revenge for being abandoned. I think it can be both. I mean, she may not even know she has those anger issues, even after hundreds of years, but it's definitely underneath yeah. the surface. Yeah, and I think she carried that with her all the way into the present story where she's had herself convinced of this thing. This is all for your own good. Um, I think she made a pretty complex villain, you know, in, well, in the grand scheme of things. I, I thought she should have been a complex villain and the seeds for that were there. But I felt like she just became a total cartoon villain, um, particularly in the last episode. I mean, Daniel, you were saying all the episodes got better. I thought the last episode was terrible i mean um it was funny because i was watching this and my, my girlfriend was just kind of like sitting nearby working on her laptop so she wasn't even watching it she was just kind of listening half listening and at one point during the 10th episode during the climax uh, she kind of looked up and said it just got really bad didn't it and i said yeah i mean it, it's like, it had like on four. the on the floor of the sky uh, the floating <laughs> yeah. um brothel in mm -hmm. the sky uh, i just thought it just got i uh, does am i am i I just feel like it's so obvious that even my girlfriend, who wasn't even really paying attention, it was pretty clear to her. But am I? Are we? Uh, are we alone in that? Do you guys not agree that the tenth episode was really underwhelming? I'll be honest. I was pretty drunk for the tenth episode, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was watching with a friend who's who's staying over, and I tried to catch him up on everything. <laughs> and then he's like, "So what?" He's like a southern guy. He's like, "So wait now, like." The, that lady is really this guy. <laughs> and I was just like, fucking pay attention. Um, anyway, yeah, I think it, I think it peaked on episode eight. Honestly, I thought that was the best episode. There were some things I liked about the final episode. I really like what they did with Lizzie. I, I feel like there's a lot of promise there for some development with her character. You know, she's essentially a human AI hybrid and so is she gonna side with the meths is she gonna side with humans or is she gonna see herself as ai like above humanity in every aspect because she's not really human anymore and then i i liked some ways that they represented uh head above the clouds um and you know i liked some of takeshi and his sister's moments but it droned on we heard about what 30 40 solid minutes of just exposition of everything and it just repeated over and over and over again just hammering in i'm a bad guy you have to shoot your friends i'm a bad guy yeah. now you have to shoot them again you know all this just it, it it droned for very long i guess that bothered me less because it felt like you know there was like trying to set up like what the, like a difficult and, and challenging situation he sort of put himself in and and so like to me it, it felt I mean, I can see what you're saying, but it, it, to me, it felt dramatically satisfying. It's just like, even if it was, you know, ultimately it was sort of like, you know, like mustache twirling. It it was, you know, it, it felt to me like interesting mustache twirling. Well, and also just the, um, you know, the, 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 when the, the um, Bancroft, like this is another sort of film noir detective kind of trope where the, um, the detective lays out all the facts against the, the villain or whatever and then they're like oh yeah you got me and i i just didn't buy that these these like incredibly ruthless cunning powerful people uh or just sort of break down and you're like oh you you we were such bad people you got us yeah. you know cersei um, doesn't do that right like <laughs> cersei's not gonna do that you know yeah those like, people like wait for just quick sh shut up and wait for your lawyer like if you're ever in that situation people <laughs> like just don't confess like that's that doesn't make any sense yeah the bancroft party thing where you know first they come he comes after bancroft and then and then he comes surprise he comes after miriam and then lizzie comes out and explains what happened to her and it's just like one after the other and 
they're just looking around like deer in the headlights being judged by all these faces that would never judge them because they've all done this shit they've all done this (laughs) hundred times over they would not care well, and I think, like, also the most interesting version of that scene had happened several episodes earlier where he gathers all the suspects and lays out a solution, except it's a complete lie, and he's, like, fabricating this thing, and he's trying to, you know, put one over on everyone, and, in fact, like, the you know, in that case, the supposed criminal doesn't confess, and it's just denying the whole way through, and they still, you know, don't believe her, and they buy his story, and and so, like, to have that much more interesting version of it play out, and then the more traditional stuff come later, I think also deflates it quite a bit. Was the 10th episode the one with the clone fight between Ortega and the sister? I think that was, was the that end the of the ninth, ninth episode. God, that was an I awesome like, fight. I love that. She grabs, that so great. she grabs a handful of glass in her, in her fancy arm and just like, whaps her upside the head with a handful of broken glass i was like oh man there's some good stuff in this show <laughs> you know it's just like so brutal yeah um, well I, I liked the clone fight too i mean and I, for listeners this is the part where ortega finds her way into ray's like clone backup vault and um and we know that ray is this unbelievable ninja fighter and so but ortega has a gun but so she's able to just gun her down but then another clone wakes up and she guns that one down and then another one and and it gets really tense because you know she has a limited amount of ammunition and then you know things like bad shit's gonna happen once she runs out of bullets to fight these different bodies well i like the way they picked that up too where then you they sort of end with sort of ortega in peril with this little girl and then yeah. she shows up at the beginning of the next episode, and you're like, wow, how did she get out of that one? Is the little girl in the apartment? And then you slowly realize that actually she's been captured, and it's, you know, Ray, you know, using her sleeve. Uh, the whole time I was wondering whether the Ortega, as an, as an actor, was going to be able to get through this series without being naked. And, then, <laughs> and I was like, oh, there's the 10th episode. They got her. <laughs> she wasn't able to make it through. Um, it's just because it's just so gratuitous throughout. Now, I feel like she was naked well before the 10th episode. Yeah, she, oh, was and, she? Right. Yeah, the she and Riker scene. had a long sex scene. Oh, wait, you're right. Okay. <laughs> that was probably Sorry. the longest one they did. And I was I was watching it at work uh, because I was trying to finish it for a review. And I'm just like looking around. Oh, God. <laughs> like hiding I feel like there computer. Were, I feel like there were multiple showers scenes as well. Um, yes. So. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, I just guess I didn't pay attention. I got to get, <laughs> get my, <laughs> my naked notes. Uh, dialed in. <laughs> um, but I mean, uh, Beth was just saying that at the end that they just sort of hit you over the head with, you know, like, oh, I did this and then I did this. So I'm so evil. And I totally agree with that. But at the same time, I think it's still way too confusing by the end. Like, wait, who, what, what was the, like, what was the like crime and everything? I mean, it gets, it, it's really <laughs> convoluted. I mean, as I, as I think it gets put together, basically like, uh, Miriam Bancroft, the wife, uh, ca- uh, beat Lizzie, causing her to miscarry, and then Ray found out about that, and then used that to blackmail Miriam into uh, giving the drug stallion to Lawrence <laughs> so that he would kill one of the prostitutes so that she could then blackmail him into voting against uh, Proposition 653 or whatever it was, and then he killed himself so that he would forget that he had done that. I mean, it gets so complicated, and uh, I, I just I yeah, wonder I how many people <laughs> about uh, that proposition thing, right? I mean, yeah, they really talked about that in the first episode, and then that's we never really heard about it, as far as I could remember. And if you can believe yeah, you're not it, invested like in it at all. some character <laughs> stories were combined into single characters. Like Lizzie is the culmination of like three different character stories. So it's even more convoluted when you're reading it in the book. I, I feel like a lot of the head in the clouds, head above the clouds, however you say it, wasn't very well explained. And I th- felt it was kind of just thrown at us last minute. And it was just a thing, but also too complicated and then they had the whole catholic you know they're secretly neo-catholic and i didn't know ray could make that design it's it's all very confusing <laughs> yeah I, I totally agree that the head in the clouds thing and and also the lizzie miscarriage beating thing should have been earlier i mean there should have been you know we should have seen people on head in the clouds or something in like 
episode four or five or something. I I, I felt like yeah, we, I I feel like he looks at it in the uh, telescope, and I feel like there's basically no mention of it before then. I mean, there's the the thing in the when I rewatched the first episode, Poe mentions it really briefly, um, and I don't remember really any other references to it. Mm. But you know, I I do appreciate the symmetry between the first and the last episodes. You know, where we pay off the the woman falling from the sky and like, you know, we sort of see, I don't know, like I kind of like just from a structural standpoint how it kind of came together in that way. Um, it's just a little hard because you are 10 hours later, you know, and it's sort of hard to remember the stuff from that happened at the beginning. Yeah. Well, it also feels a little airless to me when like everything ties together because then it, you just, I feel like you see the hand of the author a little too clearly as opposed to just having more kind of random. I mean, I guess there were also the, the red herrings that we're talking about earlier, but I think even the red herrings ultimately tie into the bigger mystery in some way, just not in the way that we think. And, and so to have it just all kind of, you know, in a bow, I, I'm not crazy about that as an ending. I mean, that's very film noir, very it's the whole the whole story is very classic film noir, right down to the scores of women who are throwing themselves at, at this dark, you know, shadowy, tortured protagonist. But it does, you know, it does leave the question of do classic film noir stories, do they ring as true for us anymore as they did, you know, as they did before? Like, does it work hmm. for does it work in our in 2018? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's what kind of scared me whenever I saw the first episode. I was thinking, oh, this again, because I think it's become a little calcified. Here's, here's what I imagine is the thinking. This is a really complicated science fictional world. There's a ton of exposition. There's a ton of shit to explain about the world. So they want to just build it on top of something that audiences already understand. Like, we're solving a crime, you know, and that's going to be sort of the guiding principle that gets audiences through all of this and, and gets them to learn all about this crazy, complicated world. But the thing is, like, is that safety net, you know, does it still apply? Just because it's so familiar doesn't mean that it's still something that we care about. It's still something that we want to follow. Well, one... Sense. One observation I read once about film noir or, you know, the PI characters that I think is really interesting is that a private investigator makes a great um, protagonist for exploring a world, like even a science fiction world, because a private investigator is really the only kind of character who interacts with everybody in every stratum of society from the like drug dealer on the street corner to the richest, you know, billionaire in his mansion. And so if you want to show if you've constructed a a great science fiction world as this show does, it's really good to have a private investigator to be able to move through it and show how this technology is playing out in the mansions, in the on the street, in the military, et cetera. So I think that still works really well. But I just think there are certain conventions of the film noir, or, you know, crime noir sort of genre that are just stale at this point. And one of them is the just sort of macho macho-ness uh i just think you know is played out at this point yeah it's just not interesting in any way yeah i'm with you on that <laughs> but i love the the world i love all the, i love the ai characters and the and the all the really inventive technology and and the way they use the sleeves uh to explore really emotional situations um I mean, that was the great strength of the series, I thought. I'm really curious how they're going to do season two. You know, what do they do now? They kind of, like you said, wrapped it up with a bow. So new what's actor. left? <laughs> he's got, he's oh, got really? a new body now. Oh, for sure. Joel Fancy. Kinnaman only signed up for one season. He's out. Yeah. It's a new sleeve, man. It's a whole new <laughs> world. Which is why you don't see his face at the end. Yep. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's a good start. <laughs> so, Beth, you actually said that actor was, I think you said, your least favorite part of the show? Yeah, I mean, I've never been a huge fan of Joel Kinnaman altogether. I think he's okay. And I feel like here he was at, he was better than I've seen him in previous stuff. He's better than in, for example, Suicide Squad. Although that's not really, you know, that's not a super <laughs> high bar to jump over. I just don't feel he's very ranged. 
He doesn't have a lot of range, and he's literally playing a character inside another character. He is playing... He's not playing himself. He's supposed to be playing Takeshi Kovach, but he was playing Joel Kinnaman as Take- Takeshi Kovach, and it really tested the limits of how much I could envision the character versus envisioning the actor. And I just, like... It kind of reminded me of Eliza Dushku on Dollhouse, where she's supposed to be playing all these different characters, and they all end up just being slightly varied versions of Faith from Buffy. Like, it ends up being slightly varied versions. And he has the same issues, and I felt like it limited what we understood about the character and didn't really give us a chance to to explore his inner psyche the way we could in a first-person narrative in the book. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I, I didn't feel like there was really any, you know, like, well, you saw Takeshi Kovacs in the past, and then you saw, yeah, Joel Kinnaman in the present. And I didn't feel like there was really any way that you would associate those characters with each other if you weren't told that they're the same character. They didn't seem like the same person or anything in any particular way. Does anyone yeah, know like, disagree with that? Like, sort of Will dickish. actually laughed and smiled. I was like, this is the Takeshi I want. He has a sense of humor. Uh, what did you What did you say, Anthony? Well, I was saying that, I mean, I think there's a little bit of a connection just in the sense that the, I guess, the other, the sort of, the, the Kovach, who's not the original but isn't Joel Kinnaman, also has that sort of, like, cocky kind of machismo. So you can, you can kind of see it, but it's not like, you don't get, I don't, I certainly don't get the sense that they coordinated their performances in any way or that, like, you know, that, that there's like a real arc between them. I mean, it, it wasn't totally unbelievable, but I agree that, that there doesn't seem to be much there in terms of like fitting those three performances together. Yeah. Not like Abuelita, who was hobbling around, had a bad back, like looked exactly like a grandma trapped in a thug's body. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, maybe that was an easier thing to do because they're so different. I mean, both of these guys are just badass soldier dudes right so it's kind of a blank slate yeah well so what did you guys think about some of these other characters we haven't really talked about vernon elliott uh we haven't really talked about mr lung or the ghost walker guy um do you guys have any uh any thoughts about either of those characters i really liked vernon and ava uh, especially like I loved when I loved Vernon when Ava came back into his life. I really liked their dynamic together. Uh, I especially liked it because Vernon wasn't really a big part of the book. Lizzie wasn't even alive in, in the book and Ava also was not alive. So this family got a really big expansion for the show, which I felt was very needed because Takeshi needed somebody to bounce ideas off of that wasn't just an AI, although I loved Poe. Poe was amazing. <laughs> um, but once Ava came back into Vernon's life, we got this really interesting examination of identity that should have been present with Takeshi with Joel Kinnaman, but it wasn't quite there. But this is, this is a man who's, who's come faced with his wife who's in a man's body. And you see there's this moment of hesitation and then it's gone. And I actually felt that was really clever because in the future, bodies don't mean anything so gender yeah. would presumably not mean the same thing as we sometimes uh you know associate now and when lizzie sees her mother she doesn't even see she sees what she wants to see i guess there's that part where she says something's different oh you've got a haircut like i that was that was episode eight and that's what i love i mean that was for me the high point of the whole series was that um that really amazing part where they get reunited and they that realization, man, that had me. That had my heart. <laughs> I was like pretty pulled in by that. Well, yeah. And so what we're saying, like with the Abuelita and then with, with Lizzie and her mother as well, is I, I just wish the show had had a little bit more time for just what does it mean for people you know and love to be to appear to you in different bodies over time? Um, and maybe they could have just streamlined the mystery plot, which was okay and was just overly confusing, I think, in the end. Cause, cause it's, it's more of those quiet moments from this, um, that, that seem to stick out in my mind. Well, I loved when he, when he discovered that the, 
the lady's daughter had been sleeving herself in her mom's body and then like hooking up with people like i felt that was ultimately a red herring i guess but i felt like that was a really strong use of the of the world in order to push the plot forward in a unique way but then it just kind of got left and that was weird that was so weird <laughs> that whole scene yeah. i'm like no no i have limits <laughs> I would right? no, I would never go into my mom's body. No. Hang <laughs> a dude. No, God, Although no, if it's God. your mom's body that like is like, you know, the you know, tenth or twentieth clone anyway, maybe it's slightly okay. I don't know. <laughs> I, I will say one other thing. Yeah, like fifth fifth clone <laughs> is is totally yeah. wrong, but tenth clone That's like, all right. right. <laughs> We've done it. Yeah, it's like, well, yeah. yeah. I, I was gonna say one other thing that I wish they'd explored in that area was the question of, you know, how much um, you know, your consciousness and yourself is like inherently tied to one body, um, which I think they touch on a little bit in the book where they have this moment where, where basically when Takeshi switches bodies or switches sleeves, his sexual attraction to somebody just basically evaporates. Um, and I think like they don't do a lot with the book either, but I think like they, in, in both, they, they mostly just treat it as if like consciousness is entirely this sort of thing that can be, you know, transferred digitally. Um, and and I, I think it would have been more interesting if, if there had been some suggestion that there's all, you know, that, that, that some of that has to just come from the body itself. Yeah, that's that's such see, the more they explore their their science fiction concept, I think the stronger the material like when they're trying at the end to make uh, Ray seem evil and they're. And they're depending on, like, real basic stuff like, oh, you killed her family, right? Like, okay, that's pretty damn evil. Like, I get it. And they keep showing those kids his legs, you know? Remember that? Like, they show it, like, three, four times. The, the police captain pukes. I'm like, what's behind the couch? But, like, if I would have been much more convinced and horrified if she had been doing something that was related to the high concept. Like, if she had been copying their bodies into goldfish like you know like Beth was talking about like that to me is way more horrifying and villainous and also you know exists within the context of the show more natural fit um to, to convey you know for instance that ray is like a villain like i wish they would have done more to to explore that stuff and get it in here you know to drive the show one thing i also would have loved to see more of is when it comes to the meths and their godlike status, as we see with the Shadow Walker, there's sort of a religion that's growing around these human beings who have been living for so long. You know, when Bancroft goes to visit these, you know, people who've contracted a disease so they can't be out and that they're quarantined, you know, they see him as a god. You know, he's bestowing gifts upon the people and they're idolizing him. And then you've got this one dude who's, you know, clearly this we devout weirdo who murders in the name of his almighty lords. But we don't get a sense of, are these isolated examples? Or is there an actual religion that is rising up to perhaps combat with the neo-Catholics about human beings who they see as gods? Yeah, that's so neat. Maybe they'll explore it in the next season. <laughs> Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, and I, I have forgotten about that scene you just mentioned where Bancroft goes and there are these, they're like lepers, basically. They have some sort of, um, I think it was some sort of manufactured disease or something, but uh, that he just touched, like no one, no one will touch them and he touches them and he dies, but he just, you know, gets backed up in a new body. I thought that was really fascinating. Um, and yeah, I wish they had done more with Mr. Long and his religion. Like, is he, is are there other people like him? Is this just some weird thing that he came up with or yeah is there more of a movement uh because it is it, it starts to get into sort of um uh, kind of like roger zelazny's um uh lord of light that lord kind of, of light, idea yeah, yeah. where the uh the immortal the the technological immortals just tell people that they're gods and who are the sort of common people how, how would they know any differently um but yeah all right cool so um all right i think that's covered all the characters then and all the concepts i have here yeah well i guess i did want to touch talk a little bit more about lizzie because i i have to say like i thought like where they were most of the time i thought she was a pretty interesting character but in terms of the 10th episode being bad that was where i really felt like i i did not like what they did with her character once she kind of re-entered the you know the real world i think partly because it seemed like they were pulling in two different directions one where the, she was going to be this sort of like distant godlike figure 
and one where she's just sort of this like avenging angel and like and and I like that like Beth was saying that you know potentially it could go in either direction and that's an interesting tension but it felt more sort of incoherent to me especially when you start with this scene where she like where you see Poe who's like been like in some ways the most interesting and sympathetic character die and she really doesn't have any meaningful response to that and then she goes up to head in the clouds and she you know is like there's like no real urgency to like what she's doing um but like they're playing this mu- it's it's a lot of it has to do with the music cue they were using for a lot of her early scenes in the head in the clouds where it just felt like you're supposed to be like yeah yeah this is awesome she's killing these guys it's crazy great outfit and it just did not yeah and it just didn't work for me at all because it just felt so disconnected to everything else that had been established about her character and everything that's happening around her I was so into it. <laughs> I'm like on the other end. I loved Lizzie's journey. I liked where it ended up. Uh, I I thought her costume was really interesting. I got to talk to the the costume designer, and she said that the costume was really designed to explore the intersection between uh, superheroes and fetishism, which I thought was really interesting because that's actually a very real part of female superhero costume history. And I just love badass women in cat suits killing dudes <laughs> who are wearing no pants. I'm for it. <laughs> Can't argue with that. I didn't like to see Poe die. Obviously, he was my favorite character. <laughs> I don't think anyone did. I, I hope he bummed. comes back. Like he can't Me be too. dead, dead, right? Like he's still chilling in the bar. He's playing poker. He's fine. Yeah. Well, I think we should mention too that I haven't I haven't read the book, but in the book it's not Edgar Allan Poe; it's like a Jimi Hendrix themed um, hotel. And in this interview I watched with the showrunner, she said that um, they they couldn't use Jimi Hendrix obviously because the Jimi Hendrix estate has very specific rules about him not being associated with too much violence, and uh, obviously that was just not gonna not gonna <laughs> yeah. fly in this show. Um, so, although I also just think the show the. Poe just has much more personality than the Hendrix AI does in the, in the book. I mean, it, it it has some in the book, and that's kind of there, but it feels like they developed it much more for the show. It connects a lot more to the noir, and it really provides a an interesting companion for for uh, Takeshi in that he's likewise, you know, he's a little somber, but he's also very he's he's eager and he's hopeful and he's helpful. But then you also get these weird ravens, so. Yeah, it's a good combo. <laughs> Takeshi never has a soft moment with him, though. You know, he treats him like a machine the whole time, which I was kind of hoping he would grow on him at some point. But I can't recall a single moment where where he gets treated with respect by Kovach. Or even if there's just like the even if he's mostly gruff, you get like the one moment where you see that he really yeah. respects him. But like that's not there at all. Mm. I think the saddest moment is when you hear that no one ever visits these hotels anymore. I'm like, oh my god, what? This thing is amazing. Why does no one go to AI <laughs> hotels? Like, they're all being turned into sex clubs because no one likes Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> um, By the I way, there, there's a hotel on the Oregon coast that is themed... Uh, each room is themed after a writer, and I have stayed in the Poe room, and it has the Damascus blade hanging over the bed, uh, <laughs> ready to chop you in half. It's full of ravens. <laughs> it's a very creepy hotel room to sleep in, but uh, th- that does exist. <laughs> well, if there's a digital you know, Edgar Allan Poe that just shows up randomly and lets strange people into my apartment, then we're good to go. <laughs> Okay, so we're almost out of time, but let's talk a little bit more about season two. Uh, I mean, we mentioned a little bit, but um, has it, have any of you guys read other the other books in the series? I haven't, but no, nobody. Just the first. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, I um, the showrunner mentioned uh, apparently they made a lot of changes to this that are going to seriously affect the second, you know, adapting the second book. Um, so, uh, she said something, there's something about a, uh, an archaeological dig, um, and that they might have to really change that a lot. Does anyone, is this, is this going to get a second season? Have they, uh, announced anything about that yet? I thought they did, but they m- maybe, I mean, I thought it was assumed that it was getting a second season, but I'm frankly not sure. I mean, I was surprised at how little Netflix promoted this show. Like, they really didn't actually start promoting it until December. And, you know, on the week of its release, they did the surprise release of Cloverfield Paradox. So it kind of overshadowed the show 
So I don't know. I don't know how much of a future it has. I hope it gets another season. I'd like to see more of it, but I don't know. Me too. Yeah, I memorized a lot of stuff. All right. <laughs> more seasons. Like, I am like fully immersed in this world. I'm I'm spun up. Got to so make it worth my show time. Me more. <laughs> I mean, the critical response to this has been really split, right? I've heard a lot of people yeah. say, "Oh, this is amazing," and then a lot of people say, "Oh, this is pretty much a dud." Um, it's something like 61% right now on Rotten Tomatoes. So I don't know if that's going to affect uh, whether it gets a second season or not. I don't know. Do you, do you guys have any sense of how popular this is or how many people are watching it, anything like that? My nerd friends are watching it. I've heard a lot of people saying like that they know it exists or they saw an episode and then nothing followed through. Like there's, I'm not here. I'm not seeing a lot of rave response and it's also not getting the delayed, you know, uh, word of mouth that first seasons of Stranger Things did. Yeah, it seems like anecdotally just a lot of people being like, when I bring up the fact that I'm watching it, they'll say, oh, should I watch that? So they know it's happening, but they, they're not watching it yet, which, I mean, does suggest that there's some level of awareness. So it's not totally, you know, sinking without a trace, but not that it's a home run yet. <sighs> yeah, it gives me hope because all the science fiction I write has too much stuff going on too much exposition so i hope this does well because it gives me hope that you can create a really complex world and tell a cool story and, and get away with it you know but we'll yeah see. I'm, yeah i mean and again the the world building in this is so good and yeah I, I hope that more things like this get made and uh i certainly i enjoy, except for the 10th episode as i said i i really <laughs> enjoyed this whole thing i watched every episode and i was just you know eager to get to the next one. So, um, yeah, I hope it gets to season two as well. All right, cool. So any, uh, any other final thoughts before we wrap this up? I like that they had multiple actors from Dollhouse and one actor from Buffy. So like for, for Joss Whedon fans, little Easter eggs. They were everywhere, <laughs> every, like every other episode. And one of them also spoke with a horrible Russian accent. I was like, this is beautifully <laughs> terrible. Thank you. Thank you for this gift. <laughs> There's yeah, there's a long tradition of terrible Russian accents on American TV and movies. So I, I yeah, I, it worked. It was good. He was having a good time. Everyone was having a good time except Joel Kinnaman, who was just doing a lot of push-ups. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So I think we'll wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Daniel H. Wilson, Beth Elderkin, and Anthony Ha. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Daniel H. Wilson, Beth Elderkin, and Anthony Ha for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. I also want to thank Serial Box for sponsoring today's show. Check out their new thriller, False Idols. And remember that you can get a discount on the first season of any Serial Box series by visiting SerialBox.com and using the promo code GEEK18. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show... Visit GeeksGuideShow.com. To learn more about your host, visit DavidBarrKirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.